Ross here again. So we're going to be covering a new chapter, um, a new chapter called Impulse Control Disorders. And what's going to be happening is uh, I'm going to go through a very general overview of this chapter. Once again, because we're talking about A2 level studies, you need to read beyond the slides, beyond the textbook, beyond just the single YouTube video, right? Um, reason being because you have to write a lot of information when it comes to A2 essays. So you really need to go in depth. And the only way you're going to get depth is if you read the actual studies which are involved, right? So in order to do that, you must you know, download those studies, go and find them on Google. You can pretty much find anything on Google these days. So please, if you see things that you don't recognize, words that you don't understand, please go and Google them, search, understand, um, so that you can write better, okay? But anyway, I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you a general overview. I usually ask my students this question. What impulses do you find hard to resist? And usually the answer I get is sleeping, right? Teacher, uh, Mr. Ross, we, we love to sleep and it's hard. In, in, in fact, I even struggle with that in the morning. You know, I really don't like getting up in the morning. I, I really find it hard to uh, resist the impulse to just go back and sleep and wish that the world was not in a pandemic. But, you know, such is life. Anyway, so let's look at some of the characteristics of impulse control disorders. Uh, firstly, uh, we have to look at a definition uh, from Griffith, right? Uh, there are some addictions, okay, I'll explain why we're talking about addictions, but there are some addictions that don't involve drugs, okay, such as addictions to gambling, sex, exercise, video games, and so on and so forth, right? A person can be a gambling addict, a sex addict, you know, addicted to exercise, addicted to playing video games 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right? These are, in a sense, related to our topic of impulse control disorders, but they have a slightly unique place, right, because they're kind of an addiction, right? It's just like how you feel an impulse to gamble, right? Gamblers feel an impulse to gamble. And in fact, there's a disorder called gambling disorder where they feel that strong impulse to go and do it. Uh, but unlike, for example, uh, uh, um, smoking, you know, smoking is an addiction where your body is addicted to nicotine, right? And the nicotine is what is, is that strong, it, it's, it's, it's driving your body to get more and more of it, right? Your body is dependent on the nicotine. Whereas there are some addictions that don't involve drugs and are more related to impulse control disorders, right? And they share similar components with ICDs, right? Impulse control disorders. So the components that we talk about in terms of impulse uh, control disorders are first of all salience, right? So what is salience? Salience is the uh, uh, when something becomes very. It's like the um, how do I explain? It's the only thing that you focus on in your life, right? So it is like. Um, you, you forget everything else and you just focus on one thing and that's salience, okay? Let me just double check that to make sure I'm correct, but it should be. Yeah, so it's, it's when the activity that you're doing takes over uh, everything, right? It takes over your brain it, it, that's all you think about, right? So let's say you're a gambler, all you think about is gambling, 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 right? That's called salience. Next, um, uh, mood modification, all right? So for example, what happens here is that when you feel the need to do something, an impulsive action, the mood modification is where you feel uh, uh, your mood feels high. You feel like you're on drugs. You feel like you're high, you're excited. Um, all you want to do is, is enjoy that feel, that buzz. People say you get a feel of buzz, a feeling of escape, a feeling of peace while you're doing that thing. Next, you experience tolerance, right? So uh, just like a typical addict, right? If you take a little bit of something, you need to take a little bit more the next time, a little bit more and more and more, right? So if you're addicted to smoking, for example, maybe you start off with just one cigarette and then you need two cigarettes to get the same feeling. Then you need three, four, five. So your body develops a tolerance towards it. You need to do it more and more in order to feel the same feeling of high. Then you might go through withdrawal, right? So you try to stop these addictions, you know, it's bad for you, it's bad for your health. You try to stop and you feel a sense of withdrawal. You get very annoyed, angry, very unpleasant feelings. You need to keep doing it in order to feel good again, right? And then you go through conflict. So conflict is what happens when you start fighting with people around you, your family, your friends, you get into a lot of arguments with them. Uh, it affects your life, their life, and everybody who's closest to you is affected by it because, because you keep wanting to go and do these addictions and it hurts other people. Right. Lastly is relapse. Okay, so perhaps after a certain amount of time, you really try not to go back to these addictions, and then sometimes you might have relapse. Right. So maybe three months you stop smoking, stop gambling, and then suddenly you start it, start doing it again. Right. So that can happen as well. Okay. Uh, so there's this video here, uh, which I won't be showing it, but essentially it was about a uh, gambling addict. Right. This is a reenactment of a true story. I believe it was someone in Singapore. Right, so he, he would do all these bettings, right? I would bet in denominations of 500 Singapore dollars per game, 
right? That's a lot of money, right? So in a week itself, I reckon like $3,000 to probably $10,000. Can you imagine just giving out $10,000 every week, just betting and betting and betting? He had debts of $70,000, but he would continue betting. He had to go and see counseling services. He had to go for a, a, a religious help with his church and all that. And it was really, really difficult, right? It affected every single person around him. Okay, I won't show you the whole thing, but you can find the video online. Just type gambling addict Singapore and so on and so forth. You'll get that, okay? So uh, it's really quite difficult having an addiction, having an impulse control disorder. Um, and um, okay, so this is an activity I usually do with my students, try and uh, match up uh, which... Uh, uh, characteristic goes to which explanation, right? So look at explanation A, compromises relationships, compromises work, social activities, internal distress. I can't remember which, I think I put the arrows from left to right, so salience first. Okay, salience is B, most important activity, it dominates thinking, feeling, behavior, and it gives you a crave, uh, your craving for the activity. All you can think about is that activity, right? What about mood modification? Okay, look at the answers. Where does mood modification go to? Okay, it goes to E, feeling a, a buzz, a high feeling, feeling a peace and escape. Yep. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, I'll give you a second to think. Okay, where does it go to? It goes, uh, tolerance goes to more of the activities needed. Sorry, I accidentally pressed the button. Withdrawal is unpleasant feelings, physical effects when the behavior is reduced. Conflict is uh, compromising relationships, compromising work, social activities, internal distress, want to stop but can't. Okay, relapse, return to addiction even after years of controlling it. Right. All right, so uh, just keep this in mind. These are six characteristics. It can be a little bit hard to keep track, but um, just you, you kind of just have to uh, memorize it. Okay, uh, next let's look at the DSM. So I always like to look back at the DSM and how they classify disorders. Um, so you can look at this page. It's uh, substance related and addictive disorders. So these are different from um, these are different from ICDs and addiction disorders because, the, uh, sorry, excuse me. These are different from ICDs because these are related to a substance addiction, right? So there's substance related disorders. You can look there. Alcohol is there. The alcohol intoxication, alcohol withdrawal, blah, blah, blah. Cannabis is there. So weed, you know, uh, hallucinogens and stuff like that. So these are disorders where it's, it's directly caused by an addiction to a substance. Now, it has to be different from an ICD because in an impulse control disorder, there's no substance. Right now, we looked at uh, gambling. Gambling gambling is a little bit unique, but um, essentially, you have to realize that uh, even though someone with uh, these addiction disorders may have similar characteristics to a person with impulse control disorders, they are classified slightly differently, right? It depends on whether or not they're, they're, there's a substance behind it, okay? That's why you have here disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. So this is all the impulse control disorders. You can see down there, oppositional defined disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, conduct disorder, antisocial personality disorder, pyromania, which we'll be looking at, kleptomania, we'll also be looking at that, other specified uh, disruptive impulse control, conduct disorder, unspecified impulse control, and so on. So, right, so although they, they share similar characteristics, the difference here is that these disorders um, don't depend on a substance. You're not doing them out of the sake of, of, of you know, getting a high from taking a substance, whereas addictive disorders, they are based on a substance. But gambling, you see, doesn't have a substance, right? Although people call it a gambling addiction, right, or gambling disorder, so it has a bit of a special place, sort of like in between, but usually it comes under ICD rather than addiction, okay? So what happens, what, what is the, the process that goes through a person, or rather a person goes through when they're uh, carrying this out? Right? So first they feel an impulse. Okay, I need to do something. I need to steal. I need to gamble. Right? They feel the impulse driving them to do something. So that, that creates a sense of tension. They know they shouldn't be doing it, right? but they really feel the need to do it. I need to do it. I need to do it. But they feel the tension there right? in your mind. And then after you've done it, you feel a sense of incredible pleasure. Right? After you gamble, you, you steal something, you, you feel, oh my gosh, it feels so good. Right? It feels amazing. Right? Then you get the sense of relief. Right? All the tension is gone. So you feel really, ah, okay, I've done it. Okay? And then you might feel a sense of guilt if you know that you shouldn't have done it, 
right? Or in some cases, you may not feel guilt, right? If you haven't hurt or done anything, you know, too bad to a person, right? So you may not feel guilty, right? It depends on the person, depends on the situation. But this is usually what happens. Impulse, tension, pleasure, relief, and then guilt or no guilt, right? So uh, the first one we're looking for is this impulse to steal. Who knows what it's called, right? It starts with letter K. We looked at it earlier, just a moment ago, right? Um... And uh, it's called kleptomania, right? For those of you who know it, kleptomania. So kleptomania is the impulse control disorder to steal, right? So uh, there are many types. In your syllabus, we cover kleptomania. It's an impulse control disorder where you cannot resist stealing objects, right? People who have kleptomania, they just, they just have this desire to steal, right? And uh, it's a lot of tension. They know they shouldn't do it, but they still do it anyway. And then after they do it, it's followed by pleasure. Uh, it affects a very small amount of the population, 0.3 to 0.6% of the population. And it seems to affect more females than males, right? I'm not sure why. I haven't really read any research if there seems to be a, you know, a genetic difference between males and females about this. But it seems to, to affect more females than males, right? Um, the urges to steal really can affect a person, right? You know that it's wrong, but you really you just don't know why. You just have this insatiable desire that you just need to steal something, right? Um... Now, is it the same as being a thief, right? This is something I ask my students. What do you think? Is having an impulse control disorder, this urge to steal, is it the same as being a thief, right? What do you guys think? Yes, no? Well, not exactly. You see, a thief doesn't have an impulse to steal. Rather, a thief plans to steal something of value, right? That's what thieves do. They want to steal money. They want to steal valuable things so they can sell it, make money, and, you know, whatever, right? A, a, a person who's a kleptomaniac First and foremost, they don't plan to steal anything. It's just they suddenly, as they're walking around, they get an urge to do it. Just, want, just grab stuff. Right? It's an urge to do it that they can't resist. Secondly, they don't steal anything of value. So what makes kleptomaniacs interesting is that they don't steal valuable things. They usually steal things which are of no value. Uh, they're just like small little things. Like, you know, just, they just grab it. If it's just in front of them, they just grab it. Right? It's not something like gold or money or, or anything expensive. They just grab it. Right? And so it's not exactly the same as being a thief. In fact, I remember reading a case study where a woman had kleptomania and she had a friend who, had, uh, who ran a convenience store. And this woman suffered with kleptomania, her friend, right? and she couldn't control it. So she always had the urge to steal and she always gets in trouble. So her friend who runs a convenience store said, hey, you have kleptomania, I have a convenience store. Why don't you just come into my store every day and just take something, right? Because she knows that as a friend, she, she's not going to do anything with the stuff that she takes, right? Kleptomaniacs don't care about the things they take. They just take anything that's in front of them. And then her friend is just going to go to the house, take back her stuff and put it back in the convenience store. That way, her friend will not get into trouble with the police and, and you know, will not be called a criminal because she's not really stealing. She's just taking stuff from a friend's shop and, and take, bringing it back home and a friend gets it back later. So I thought that was a pretty clever way to you know, solve the problem, right? Of course, stealing comes with consequences, right? If you go to another person's shop who doesn't know who you are and you have this urge to steal and you steal, that's, that's a criminal offense, right? It's, it's crime. So you can get sent to prison. And that's a problem for people who are kleptomaniacs. They don't mean to do it. They don't want to really do it. But they, they have this uncontrollable urge to just steal. And this is a recognized mental disorder. So, you know, if, if you can plead in court that you have this mental problem, you may get away with it, right? Now, how do you measure this? How do you know whether someone has kleptomania? So there is a scale, kleptomania uh, symptom assessment scale, KSAS, right? Um, it goes from zero to four, none to extreme, right? So let's look at some of the questions, right? The following questions are aimed at evaluating kleptomania symptoms. Please read, please read the questions carefully before you answer. If you have had urges to steal during the past week on average, how strong were your urges? Please circle the most appropriate number so you, you guys can answer this in your head. How strong were your urges to steal? I didn't feel any urge to steal, so I'm going to put zero, right? Someone with kleptomania will probably put three or four, right? Next question, during the past week, how many times you experienced urges? And so on and so forth, right? So uh, uh, there are a variety of questions that which, which test. I can't remember how many questions exactly, uh, but you should make an effort to go and find the scale online, download it, read it, and memorize at least two of the items, right? Because it might come out in the exam, you know, right? What are one of the items, you know, is it a valid scale? Is it quantitative? You know, how many items are there? So uh, you should know the scale um, uh, like the back of your hand. So it tests for impulses, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are all related to kleptomania. It is a type of self-report, right? So this is something that you can just do as a survey on your own. There are 11 items on a scale of zero to four, right? Uh, the higher your score, the higher you have kleptomania, the higher, uh, the higher your kleptomania uh, characteristics, right? 
Um, it also has very good pretest re reliability. So this is when you administer a test to someone and then you administer it again at a different time and again at a different time. And it seems that this test has a very high retest reliability, meaning that you can administer it to the same person over and over again and they get the same response, which is a good thing, right? It also shows a lot of concurrent validity. Okay, concurrent validity. Okay, let me explain. What does concurrent validity mean, right? Um, uh, concurrent validity is when, okay, so we're talking about validity, so whether something is accurately measuring what it's supposed to measure. Concurrent here means that um, together with another scale, it measures in the direction that it should be measuring uh, in, in the expected direction. I'll give you an example. I'm just trying to remember what the name of the GAFS scale is. Okay, it's Global Assessment of Functioning Scale, right? Global Assessment of Functioning Scale. So essentially, in a sense, if you score high on the GAFS, it means that you can function well, right? If you score high on kleptomania, it means you are stealing a lot, right? So you have, you know, in, a, in another way of saying bad functioning. So if a person has a high kleptomania score, would you expect them to have a high or a low GAFS score? They should have a low GAFS score because obviously if they have kleptomania, they're probably not functioning very well in society, right? So if you have a high kleptomania score and a low GAFS score, that shows concurrent validity, right? It makes sense that this person scores low on GAFS and high on kleptomania. If a person scores high on kleptomania and high on GAFS, that doesn't make sense. You can't have impulse control disorder and be a very good functioning human being, right? That doesn't make logical sense. So that's what concurrent validity is. You take a, a scale that you can logically understand. If this scale goes in this particular direction, I should get either the same direction or an opposite direction from another scale, right? So it shows concurrent validity, which is good. And also, also it produces quantitative data, which makes it easy to calculate and compare, you know, between people, okay? But also remember that although this sounds good, what are the weaknesses of self-reports, for example, right? Oftentimes we have to evaluate, right, in our essay questions, what are the weaknesses of this or weaknesses of that, right? So when it comes to self-report, what's the weakness? The weakness is that it is, right, it's rather biased, right, because a person can answer whatever they want. Especially when you ask someone questions which are very sensitive about their disorder, they may not feel comfortable sharing about it, you know, to any, any random stranger. And so because of that, um, they may give bias or very inaccurate results, right? So you have to be aware that although self-reports are easier for people to fill up, they're not so, uh, they, they, they can contain bias and people may, may report dishonestly, okay? Okay, the next, the next impulse control disorder, what does that look like? Anybody can guess? Okay, so it's pyromania, right? If you heard the word pyromania, I, I referred to it earlier in the DSM. So pyromania is this incredible uh, impulse to set things on fire, right? It's a fascinate, It's also a fascination with fire, right? I, in fact, when I was a young boy, I was quite fascinated with fire. Uh, you know, I'm actually a magician. I love performing magic tricks. And often I, for my class, I actually did a fire magic trick for my students to watch. And so I'm very fascinated by fire, right? But I don't feel an insatiable or, or an uh, uh, unresist, irresistible impulse to set everything on fire, right? Uh, people with pyromania have that problem, right? So it's an impulse control disorder. It's an impulse to start fires, right? Um, so again, it's tension followed by pleasure. You feel this tension that, you know, you shouldn't start a fire randomly anywhere, you know, you are, and that's why you start a fire. And then you feel the pleasure after doing it, right? So it's also a fascination with fire, right? It's people who are fascinated by fire and they just want to keep looking at it. They just want to look at things. In fact, it doesn't even have to be fire. It could be other things. It's just, it could just be watching a movie that has fire in it, right? And that could also give them that sense of pleasure. Um, they're also attracted to accelerants and explosions. So accelerants are things like, you know, gas, fuel, lighter fluid and stuff like that. And, you know, those things that make fires bigger and stuff like that. You know, explosions, boom, boom, boom. Right? They want to see explosions. They want to see things go, go up in flames. Right? Um, now, some people who have pyromania, they could be indifferent. Right? So it doesn't matter to them if they set things on fire. But some people could feel distressed. Right? So, for example, you set things on fire and what if your whole house catches fire and it burns down? Right? It could leave you in a sense of distress, right? You don't, you don't mean to hurt people, right? Pyromaniacs are not there to hurt people. They don't want to cause pain to others. But they just have this strong urge and desire to set stuff on fire. And it's unfortunate, rather, that fire can be very damaging, right? So because it damages things and, and it can hurt people, they might feel distressed. But some people feel indifferent. They don't really care. Right? 
So it really depends. Now, what else might they do, right? As I gave you an example earlier, they might like to watch movies which have um, 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 fire, fiery scenes or explosions in them. What else do you think they might do? What kind of jobs do you think, um, what jobs might these people seek? Think about that. If you have pyromania and you like things which are on fire, what, what kind of job do you think would be suitable for you? All right. I, I, I give the example of a fireman, right? A fireman, right? A fireman's job is, you know, to be around fire. Although technically a fireman's job should be to put out the fire, but at least you get to see fires more often on a daily basis compared to a normal person, right? So they might, might choose jobs like firemen, right? Okay, then the disorder I talked about earlier, right? The uh, disorder that is kind of like an addiction, but it's not really an addiction to a substance. This is the gambling disorder, right? So gambling disorder is a bit unique, okay? Right? So this is a, also sometimes called a non-substance addictive disorder, right? So yes, it's an addictive disorder, but it kind of falls in between addictive disorder and impulse control disorder because you feel the impulse through gambling, but you don't have to take a substance to do it. Right? So there's no substance there. So that's why it's a non-substance addictive disorder. It, uh, it, the reason why people feel the uh, 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 addiction is because when you gamble, it stimulates your brain's reward center. Right? And this is similar to what happens to people who have substance abuse. Right? So when people smoke and the nicotine, the chemical in, in smoking that causes the addiction is nicotine, that stimulates your brain's reward center. Right? Uh, uh, alcohol and all of this, it stimulates your brain in a way that your brain becomes addicted to the substance, right? So substance abuse is when your brain gets stimulated, the reward center particularly, and you get addicted. So what happens in gambling is that although there's no substance, the process that happens in the brain is similar, right? The reward center is stimulated. It's, uh, it, it, it's classified by very persistent and problematic behavior to do with gambling, where people cannot stop gambling. They lie to their friends and family because they want to gamble. So they lie, like, oh, I really need to borrow 500 bucks. I don't have any income this month. I need to, to go and buy groceries. And then they go and gamble it away. Right? So it compromises a lot of relationships with people. You can't trust anybody. You, you know, your parents and their family can't trust you You know, because you keep lying and, and, and taking money to go and um, gamble. So again, why is this unique? It's unique because it's like an addiction, but it doesn't have a substance attached to it. Right? So it also has this impulse to gamble. So it's part of impulse control disorder but it has a special name, right? Uh, so there's another video I had here. This video was about gambling. So this video actually explains, right? We put someone in an MRI machine and, and they explain why gambling is a serious brain disorder, but the gambling industry just, you know, it preys upon it, right? So what happens is that they, they actually measured, right? They asked someone to play a game and press a button, like a roulette, and uh, they measured the brain waves, right? So they would watch this video and do it. And so they would find that what happens is that in a person's brain, at the moment, so what's interesting is that the, the, a person's brain is most highly stimulated before they win, right? It's when the ball is spinning around the roulette table. It's before the dealer opens the winning card, right? It's that it's in those few seconds before the result is announced that your brain builds up this anticipation that you're going to win, right? And that's what really, really gets people addicted, right? So even if you lose the game, you already felt the addictiveness before because you were already stimulated even before the results came out and so that's what what's what's particularly difficult it doesn't matter if you lose so even if a gambler loses five times in a row they still feel the high feeling right because every time before the result came out they already felt the the high feeling in their brain the stimulation right um and so that's why it's very difficult to to to, to control so now let's look at some of the causes, right? Uh, typically in all our abnormal psychology chapters, there are three causes, biochemical, behavioral, cognitive, right? Generally speaking. Uh, anybody with chemistry knowledge, can you recognize this chemical? I'll give you a second, try and think. What is the chemical in the brain? What is the chemical in the brain that is, that is uh, related to rewards? Okay, it is dopamine, right? So I mean, that's why young people use the word dope. Oh, that's so dope, man, right? It comes from the word dopamine, right? So teach people, if someone says, yo, that's so dope, I think you mean dopamine, which is actually this chemical symbol. I learned about it from psychology, and okay, don't, please don't do that. It's a terrible pickup line. But anyway, uh, dopamine stimulates the reward center in the brain, right? So when you have dopamine, you feel really happy, right? It's a happy chemical. It makes people feel happy, right? I wish we had a pill, right? We can take dopamine every day, but that's not very good, right? So it's triggered by rewarding stimuli, right? You eat you know, something that you really like, piece of chocolate perhaps, you get dopamine, right? You score 100% on your exams, 
you get dopamine in your brain, right? You have a happy birthday party, you get dopamine, right? And what happens is that in compulsive behaviors, like impulse control disorders, dopamine actually gets reduced. Why? Because when you keep on doing the same behavior, it's almost like your brain develops a tolerance to dopamine, right? So just like how it can develop a tolerance to alcohol, or tolerance to um, uh, uh, smoke, uh, nicotine, and so on, it's like as if your brain, in this particular type of disorder, is developing a tolerance to dopamine, right? So at first, you, you gambled once, and you got a dopamine high. Then you need, then the dopamine was, you know, reduced. Now you have to gamble two times, three times, four times to keep on stimulating your dopamine, right? And uh, so what happens is that there's this reward deficiency syndrome. So kleptomaniacs, for example, when they steal, it makes them feel a sense of pleasure. So dopamine gets re released, right? And when it becomes compulsive, so they keep on stealing, the dopamine gets reduced. So what happens then, right? So steal some more to increase the dopamine, right? So it is, it's this very vicious cycle that you steal, you get dopamine. You keep stealing, the dopamine gets reduced because you almost develop like a tolerance. And then in order to get the high feeling again, you have to steal more and more and more and bigger and bigger. Okay, maybe not necessarily bigger, but you keep stealing more and more and more to increase that dopamine feeling. Same with gambling and so on and so forth, right? Now, is this a cause and effect? Do we, is this a causal relationship? Just saying that, you know, uh, people have noticed that, you know, that there's this reward deficiency syndrome, less dopamine, more stealing. No, we can't say it's a cause and effect, right? Because in order to do that, we have to remove every other single variable, right? All other transmitters in the brain and just test dopamine and stealing, right? We wouldn't know for sure whether dopamine is the number, is the only cause, right? What we have here is more of a correlation, right? It seems that when dopamine is reduced, uh, people then go and steal more to increase their dopamine, right? We can't fully say it's cause and effect, right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, right now, as you're watching this video, you're probably not experiencing much dopamine, right? But you're not going around stealing and gambling right now to get the dopamine high, right? So we can't necessarily say that it's cause and effect, but there is some, definitely some relationship there, okay? Behavioral, okay, so let's talk about behavioral. Just now was biological, now behavioral. So uh, positive reinforcement is very important when it comes to talking about impulse control disorder, particularly operant conditioning, okay? Now operant conditioning is all about uh, rewards and punishment, right? It's conditioning someone to change their behavior using rewards and punishment. So oftentimes when you're triggered by a rewarding stimuli, that's called a positive reinforcement, right? You do your homework, I give you a sweep. That's a positive reinforcement for doing your homework. Okay, so kleptomaniacs, for example, when they steal something, that's their positive reinforcer, right? They feel good stealing. What about pyromaniacs? What is it? It's when they see fire or they set something on fire, they see the fire, they feel rewarded. What about gambler? Gambler is when they anticipate, oh, am I going to win? Am I going to win? I might win, right? That's the anticipation, right? That's also a reward. And also the winning, if they do win, it's also a reward, right? So it's rewarding stimuli, right? Now, as I asked earlier, why do gamblers still play although they lose? The answer is in that, right? The first word before the word winning anticipating right so even though a gambler may lose consecutively they still want to play because the positive reinforcer from the brain studies show that it comes in the anticipation right you put your you put your bet and the ball goes spinning around the roulette table and before it falls you've already got that rewarding stimuli because you're so excited am i going to win am i going to win oh my gosh i might win oh no i lost okay let me try it again am i going to win am i going to win right so it just it's a very vicious cycle right now, there are, there are many ways to talk about reinforcement that's continuous and there's partial reinforcement. Continuous reinforcement is very straightforward, right? A desired behavior is reinforced every time it occurs. For example, uh, there's a picture of dog treat there, right? So oftentimes if you're training an animal and you're trying to train an animal for the first time, let's say you want your dog to shake your hand, okay? So you're like, okay, doggy, shake my hand. And if it shakes your hand, you give it a treat. Okay, doggy, shake my hand again. Then give it a treat. Every time it shakes your hand, give it a treat. So continuous reinforcement is basically that every single time that you see the behavior that you want, give it a treat. Okay. Most effective when teaching a new type of behavior. So as you can see there, the dog shaking the hand, uh, the, the human gives it a treat. Okay. Creates a strong association between behavior and response. Now, partial reinforcement is most effective once a behavior has already been established. Right. The new behavior is less likely to disappear. And there are various partial reinforcement schedules available to suit individual needs. So what happens here? I'll, give, I'll use gambling as a very simple example. When a person goes gambling, right, they don't win every single time. They might win at first, then they might lose for a while, and then they win again, and then they lose for a while, then they win again, right? So it's kind of like that. The longer you play, the more often times you'll see you win, lose, win, lose, win, lose. By a random pattern, right? Most of gambling is by chance, right? So that's actually partial reinforcement. Right? People already have the compulsion to gamble and now there's a partial reinforcement reinforcing them to keep gambling. And sometimes this can be very strong. Why? 
The reason why is because you don't know when you're going to win next. And that's why you keep, want to, you keep wanting to play and play and play, right? If you only reward a person when they do the desirable behavior, then they know if they do the bad behavior, they're not going to get a reward, right? But if you want someone to... Know, so the, the person who's gambling is not sure whether they're going to win. I'm not sure whether I'm going to win the next round. Maybe I should just play to try. So can you see how that actually creates even a, a, a even stronger a, a, a desire to go and play? Because you're not sure if you're going to win. Okay, I lost. Okay, never mind. Maybe I'll play it again. I'm not sure if I'm going to win again. Maybe I'll just try. I'll just try. Maybe I'll win. Oh my gosh, I won! Right? So it, it creates this almost like an illusion that you think you can win, but you know, it's actually a type of partial reinforcement. Now, there are several schedule, uh, four schedules of partial reinforcement, which I'm not going to explain in detail. If you want to, you can go online and read about it. It can be a bit confusing, so go and find some resources to help explain it. Okay? There are four schedules of reinforcement. They're called fixed, uh, fixed ratio, fixed variable, uh, sorry, fixed ratio, fixed interval, variable ratio, variable interval. Again, I, I think it's slightly beyond the scope of this uh, uh, YouTube video, but you can find it very easily online. Okay? Now, let's look. We've looked at biological, right, dopamine. We've looked at um, uh, uh, the behavioral, which is operant conditioning, reinforces. Now we're looking at cognitive. Okay? So, cognitive is all about our thinking. Oh, my animation seems to have. Uh, gone ahead of me, positive feelings, memory of I'll come to that in a second. But cognitive, cogni cognition is all about how we think and process stuff, right? So we're going to look at Miller, 2010, who came up with the feeling state theory. Okay, so this is an a very simple explanation of the theory. Disorders are created when intense positive feelings become linked with specific behavior behaviors to form a state-dependent memory, right? Or we call this the feeling state. So if you look at the bottom here, so um, feelings here talk about thoughts, sensations, emotions, everything as one, well, right? So positive feelings, let's say you feel this positive feeling and you're, and you're doing like, you know, gambling, pyromania, whatever. And so your memory of that behavior, setting something on fire and the ama amazing positive feelings that you get, you're feeling high, you're feeling excited, looking at the fire and everything, both of that combines together to form what is known as a feeling state, right? And you keep wanting to go back to this feeling state to feel this amazing feeling, right? So that creates this disorder, right? Right? So example, pyromania, you have this feeling of, you know, I'm powerful, I'm the most powerful person on earth. Right? So I set a fire and then I feel these positive emotions right, of being powerful. I feel this physiological arousal that makes me excited right, doing this, remember that tension and pleasure. And then also you, all of this is stored in your memory. It's like, oh my gosh, this, this setting of the fire makes me feel so good. It all goes together and creates a feeling state. Right? And it creates this compulsion for me to keep on setting fires because I want to achieve this feeling state. Now, what's interesting is that Miller also noted that sometimes underlying negative thoughts and experiences can actually create the feeling states related to ICDs, right? So in general, it's usually a positive feeling that's associated with the, uh, state, uh, with, with the action that you're doing and memory, and that creates a feeling state. But in some cases, Miller said that sometimes for disorders, the reason why it's so intense is because it actually starts with a negative feeling that later becomes positive. So for example, Instead of feeling I am powerful, actually a person starts by saying I am weak, right? And then in order to feel powerful, they set something on fire and they're like, whoa, I feel powerful, I can control this fire, right? So what happens is that they start from a negative place, they do, the, they do this pyromaniac behavior, they then feel incredibly positive, right? More positive, right? So when you think about it, you're switching someone from negative to positive, that jump seems to be even more intense, right? It's highly intense and desirable from weakness to strength rather than just starting out as a strength, right? A positive feeling, right? So when they switch from weakness, set something on fire, they feel incredibly powerful, that goes together, becomes a feeling state that's very, very strong and very compulsive, okay? Now, do people feel guilt? As I said earlier, pyromaniacs, sometimes, what do you think? Do they feel guilty for setting things on fire? It depends on the person, right? Some of them may feel guilty, right? Some of them may not feel guilty, uh, if they're just setting fire, you know, on a, in, a, in an empty place that there's nobody there and they just set something on fire, it doesn't hurt anybody, they don't feel guilty. But if they set fire and someone gets hurt, you know, they can feel guilty, right? Now, cognitive, let's look at this. So they have a negative belief about the self or the world, right? So I think I'm weak, right? Now then they go and set something on fire, they get a positive belief, I'm powerful, I can set this on fire. And then the negative belief, let's say, you know, um, the, the behavior cannot be controlled, you go and set a person's house on fire, right? And you'll be like, oh no, I destroy everything, right? So you feel negative again. So then if a person feels negative, what do you think they're going to do to feel positive? They're going to go back and set another fire, right? 
just like gambling, right? Gambling feels like, oh, I'm so, I'm such a terrible person. Then they gamble. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm such a winner. I'm amazing. And then they steal people's money and then oh, they go and lie to their friends and family, take money, borrow money and go and gamble some more. And they're like, oh no, I cannot be trusted. I'm such a terrible person. And then they go and gamble again to feel good again, right? So can you see how that, that cycle creates this impulse control disorder, right? So we've looked at the causes. Now let's look at some of the treatments. How can we help people with these problems, right? So biochemical, there are a few treatments. Uh, firstly, it's uh, opiates and then uh, covert sensitization. Sorry, uh, biochemical has one treatment called opiate treatment and then cognitive behavioral, you have covert sensitization, imaginal desensitization and impulse control therapy. So these are the main uh, treatment methods for ICDs, right? So let's talk about biochemicals first. Oh, I think I have a video here. Is this video? Oh, sorry, it's the same video as before, right? So biochemicals was by Grant et al., right? So Grant uh, uh, believed that you could use opiates. Opiates are a form of strong painkillers, right? Uh, they prevent you from feeling pain. And it's often used in, you know, uh, anesthesia and stuff like that. The aim of his study was to use opiates to try and reduce gambling behavior, right? He had a very large sample, 284 participants. The experiment was done as a double-blind study. Double-blind, as I mentioned before in previous videos, means that the person in the study, the, the participant, doesn't know which condition they're in. They don't know if they're receiving the actual drug or a fake drug. And the person administering the drug also doesn't know which drug is being given. Only the researcher knows, right? The IV is the type of opiate drug that they would receive, right? Either a nalmaphene, naltrexone, or placebo, right? So nalmaphene and naltrexone are both different types of opiates. Uh, the placebo would have been basically nothing, right? Shouldn't have any, had any effect, okay? The Y box scale was used um, to, to measure this. It's called the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. Now, I know it says obsessive compulsive, uh, but it was modified slightly for gambling behavior. Right, so the Y box scale is usually for obsessive compulsive disorder, but they modified it slightly um, to measure gambling behavior. Right, uh, they, uh, their operational definition was it was considered to be a success if there was a thirty-five percent reduction in their gambling behavior. What were the results? Opiates significantly reduced gambling behavior. So that's a great thing. What does that mean? That means nalmaphene and naltrexone significantly help to improve people's lives by reducing their gambling behavior. So it does seem to show that there maybe is some uh, a, a, a link between gambling disorder and the biological symptoms, right? As we know, to do dopamine and stuff like that. So opiate seems to help, right? Help treat people. Now, what you, sh you should do is that go and find Grant et al. study in 2008 about this and go and um, read it for yourself. I'm just giving you a very brief summary. You really should read the study in more detail for your exam. And also you should talk about evaluating it, right? So I often give examples like, for example, the sample size here is really big. So that's good. A bigger sample size is very good for the study. You get a more variety of people coming in. It's, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's always good to have a large sample size, right? Um, the research method, what can you say about experiment? Is it a strength? Is it a weakness? Okay, think back about your research methodology. What can you say, right? He used an IV with three levels. He used a placebo as a control group. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? He used the Y box scale. Is the Y box scale a valid scale? Is it reliable? Go and find out online, right? He had a very good operational definition, it was very clear, right? So all those things need to be evaluated. Okay, then came Glover. Now remember, we talked about a variety of different uh, treatments. So we've done with the biochemical treatment. Now we're going to cognitive and behavioral treatments. So Glover uh, in 2011 used COVID sensitization, right? Um, sensitization there kind of gives you a little hint, right? Sensitization is to make someone sensitive towards something, right? Uh, 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 let me think of an example, right? If you, if you give someone something that's very smelly, they become very sensitive to it. Like, Ugh, it's very smelly, right? But if you give someone uh, something like... Um, I can't think of another example. Uh, let me think. Uh, yeah, okay, let's just use that now. smelliness or whatever, right? So if you use something that's very sharp, very smelly, very, very pungent, you know, it, it makes them very sensitive to it. They become very sensitive um, to things like that, right? Some people, you, you know, are very sensitive to the taste of coffee or taste of alcohol, right? Some people, like for me, for example, my tongue is very sensitive to the taste of alcohol. I really don't like it because I'm extremely sensitive to it and it feels very bitter to me, right? So covert sensitization is using this, this concept of making them feel sensitive to something. But what, what, what is that something, okay? It's, it's based on this, uh, 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 the principle of classical conditioning, right? Behavioral classical conditioning, right? Now, uh, what Glover did was Glover did a, a small sample of only one person, right? So it's kind of like a case study, right? Of a 56-year-old woman. She had a problem with stealing, right? She had a very serious problem with kleptomania. So this is a research uh, case study 
research methods, only 1%. So for 14 years, she had a history of shoplifting, right? So this is a kleptomaniac. She keeps on stealing things from stores and shops, right? Um, she came for four sessions in two-week intervals, right? What they did was they asked her to relax, right? So they uh, taught her a type of muscle relaxation. You tense your muscles up, relax, tense your muscles up, relax. And in this relaxation, what she was asked to do is imagine, right? Visualize yourself um, feeling a sense of nausea and vomiting every time you try to steal something, right? So she would relax and then visualize herself going to a supermarket or a store or a shop, steal something from that shop, and then just vomit in her imagination, start throwing up on the floor. And as she imagined, that's also imagining the people watching and the disgust that they feel towards her, right? So that visualization was, is, is how you, you make someone feel very sensitive, how someone feels very sensitive. So, of course, on normal occasions, she shoplifts and she feels very good, right? Cryptomaniacs feel a sense of pleasure when they shoplift, right? So, in order to make her more sensitive to it, instead of that, they just say, okay, imagine vomiting, imagine nausea, imagine all this disgusting stuff, right? Okay, so that's the sensitizing part, right? What were the results? What do you think? Did it work? Absolutely, it did work. Right? So she decreased in her stealing behavior. Right? In fact, over time, she only had one relapse. Right? So her life significantly improved. Right? So this treatment is effective. Right? Of course, we cannot say it's effective for everybody because unfortunately, it was only a case study with one woman. Right? So more research definitely needs to be done to understand whether this can affect other people as well, different ages, different genders, and so on. Right? So please you know, make sure you evaluate these studies. Right? Is a case study good or bad? You know? Uh, 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 was it applicable to real life, right? You know, talk about things like that in order to evaluate the study, okay? What's next? Okay, so, oh, we're back to Miller, right? So, Miller also came up with a therapy. What, what, what was the theory that Miller came up with, right? The feeling state theory. So, he came up with this impulse control uh, disorder explanation to do with feeling state. And because of that, he also came up with a corresponding therapy to help people, right? So, the goal of the therapy is to eliminate bad behavior and establish, sorry, excuse me, to establish healthy behavior. Previously, in the shoplifting example with the woman, in that covert sensitization, right, what they were trying to do is to stop bad behavior, stop stealing, make her feel like she's going to throw up every time she steals. In this case, we're not just trying to stop bad behavior, we're trying to establish healthier behavior. Okay, so for example, first you ask a person to identify the feelings and sensations associated with the compulsion. Right? How do you feel when you set things on fire? What, what, do you, what do you sense when you're stealing stuff? Right? And you measure that uh, using a positive feeling scale. So they measured it, how positive the person feels. Then they ask participants to recreate. I want you to imagine this feeling state. Okay, go and imagine yourself setting things on fire or gambling. Okay, then they do a, a, a therapy called EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Exercises. Okay, uh, I'll explain this in the next slide. Okay, but EMDR is one of the things that they do while this person is imagining the feeling state, and then reevaluate. Okay, reflect on your feeling state after having done this EMDR exercise, which I'll explain in a moment, and uh, subsequently do some more visualizations and eye movements. Sessions can take as long as, you know, three to five sessions, right, with the person. Okay, so, of course, I need to explain what is EMDR. This is the main exercise that's done while the person is doing visualization, right? So, what is EMDR? You can read it there. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing is a psychotherapy treatment that was originally designed to alleviate the distress associated with traumatic memories, right, by Shapiro. Adaptive uh, information processing model posits that EMDR therapy facilitates the, ac and the accessing and processing of traumatic memories and other adverse life experiences to bring these to an adaptive resolution. After successful treatment with EDM, EMDR, EMDR therapy, effective, uh, uh, effective distress is relieved. Negative beliefs are reformulated and physiological arousal is reduced. Okay, so it sounds very, very uh, uh, full of jargon, but basically what happens in EMDR is this. The person visualizes the feeling state, right? Or, or in this case, it came out of the sense of treating trauma, okay? So Shapiro is trying to understand how to treat trauma better. And people who have experienced trauma, what, what, what Shapiro realized was, if they move their eyes from left to right while following someone's finger, it seems to help them process their trauma and in a sense, get over it, 
right? So the problem that human beings have with traumatic and negative experiences in life is that oftentimes our brains try to protect us from this trauma. So what happens, people often repress those memories, right? So let's say you go through a traumatic experience, someone abuses you, you try to forget all these bad memories, right? You forget as much as you can. And then what happens is that because you don't process it properly and you grieve and you cry about it and you process it in a healthy way, later on it comes back in life and causes a lot of anxiety and distress, right? Because you remember all that abuse and it's all deeply stuck in your brain somewhere. So in order to process this trauma better, the person, then the clinician or therapist asks you to imagine those bad memories. And then while you're trying to imagine them, look at my finger and the person moves their finger in a left to right motion in front of their eyes. And the patient follows. And for some reason, this, this activity that's different from what's, you know, the traumatic experience, you know, they're trying to distract them in a sense, allows their brain to somehow process it at the back of their mind. Now, I know it sounds a bit, ah, does that really happen? So this is the funny thing. EMDR isn't, as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong, I'm not a licensed clinician, but as far as I'm aware and I've talked to people about it, nobody truly understands by what mechanism EMDR seems to work. But it seems to work, right? On some people, it does seem to work and it does help people process. If they just move their eyes from left to right while thinking about something, uh, while, while, while someone's finger is moving in front of their face, right? It seems to work. So Miller tested this out, okay? He tested this out in a case study as well, right? Uh, with a guy named John. Don't think that's his real name. Anyway, uh, he, uh, John's life history was that he had lost his marriage and had a lot of depression, a lot of debt, debt due to a gambling disorder, right? So he had a serious gambling disorder. He lost his wife. He was in depression, okay? So his feeling state was the memory of gambling and the intense feeling associated with winning, right? So... Um, that was his feeling state, which he had to visualize. The therapy was visualization and EMDR. Okay, was it successful? Yes, it was. As he visualized it, his eyes moved left to right while following the clinician's finger, and it helped him. It helped reduce his urges, and he was a lot less excited. And after three months, he was able to leave the poker table. Right, so he was not. In, he was not. Uh, um, you know, even though he felt the compulsion, he could just leave the table. Right? And he could uh, 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 hold a job and he's, he improved in his relationships with people. Right? So unlike just not doing gambling or reducing his gambling, he was now establishing more healthy behaviours, which is you know, being able to leave the poker table, being able to hold a job, improve on his relationships, and so on and so forth. Right? So obviously it helped him. Right? So make sure you evaluate these kind of studies as well. Go and read the original study to get more information. Okay. There was a video here. What was this video? Okay, I think this video is just, uh, this video is about EMDR therapy and stuff like that. You can find videos about EMDR online, okay, to see what, what, what they can show and uh, you can see examples there, okay. I think this was a woman explaining it. See, there's a, okay, so this, this guy is then, you know, uh, recounting a negative experience and she says, look at, look at my finger, did she show the finger? Okay, there, there we go. Can you see that? Okay, I can't show you the whole video otherwise, you know, my video will be taken, taken down from YouTube. But she's moving her hand from left to right and his eyes are just following, okay, while he's visualizing that scene in his head. And that seems to help people process their traumatic memories. Okay, anyway, that's it for now. Um, this is a very short video. Um, um, please do again consult your textbook, consult your own lecturer. Uh, go and read more information online and ve uh, very much I highly encourage you please go and read the original studies right Miller's study Glover's and all that right um, uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram and so on you can you know casually you can chat with me as well my Instagram is at magicross7 my name is Ross Stevenson and that really is a picture of me with a big afro uh, please help me out by liking commenting and subscribing to my channel this helps me you know build my YouTube channel from you know where it was Started out with zero and uh, I think I've got almost 800 plus views and uh, 800 plus subscribers and some of my videos have thousands of views. So that's very encouraging and I really thank you all so much. Um, if any of you are feeling generous, you want to donate to me, you can via PayPal. Or if you live in Malaysia, you can contact me directly and I can give you my you know, bank uh, details so you can wire transfer from overseas or from Malaysia. Or even if you want to pay me in cryptocurrency, that's perfectly fine. Except Bitcoin too. Okay, but only if you are able to, right? If you're a student and you're living on a tight budget, don't feel uh, obliged to do it. Right? Thank you so much and uh, all the best in your psychology.